So chapter 24, it is the harmony and conflict of interests. Yeah, and this was the last chapter of part four. Right. So that's exciting. Mm -hmm. Part five, he keeps alluding to like, oh, I'll deal with the problem with socialism in part yeah, five. Yeah, it, it seems like he's setting up to like destroy it. Yeah, I'm like, give me, give me what, what give me the goods. Okay, so section one, the ultimate source of profit and loss on the market. What is the Montaigne dogma? So this is the idea that there's winners, the winners ca cause other people to lose in the economy. Uh, false. Right. And the way I thought about this is like, if we both show up to the beach with like food stands and you show up with ice cream and I show up with hot chocolate, just, <laughs> <laughs> just because you, you're making a lot of money and I happen to lose money doesn't mean that like you caused me to lose money. Yeah. No one would be going for hot chocolate anyway. Right. Cause it's <laughs> too hot already. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Valid. I can't believe anyone would think otherwise. It seems obvious. Not necessarily, I think. Like, because... Maybe the situations aren't as obvious. Right. Like, oh, you sell shoes, I sell shoes, you're, everyone's buying your shoes. What the hell? Yeah, exactly. You know, but it's like, well, your shoes are square. They're, yeah, they're, maybe they're I wrong. really thought people wanted hot chocolate, and I'm like, this is no fair. They're just, you're taking all my business. Yeah, or maybe you have to wait till it's nighttime. <laughs> All right. What is the ultimate source of profits? What is the source of losses? And I would say it's the source of profits is acting in anticipation of future conditions. Yes. And losses is not correctly predicting the future. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. That's what sets entrepreneurs apart. Mm hmm from, like, a socialist um, commissar. Right. So here's a comment. There are, in the market economy, no conflicts between the interests of buyers and sellers. No conflicts of interest? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They're partners. They're working together. Right. So, part two. The yep. limitation of offspring. What... Uh, what does it mean to live humanly, according to Mises? Um, above subsistence, not just enough yeah. to eat and procreate. Like, I don't think he gets specific, like, oh, you have to listen to classical music, but it's like, you have to have more than enough to survive. Right. Yeah, exactly. I think that's how he explains, like, why man just doesn't go around and, like, procreate nonstop as much as he could. Yeah, because they're like, I want my life to be nice. I don't just want to <laughs> reproduce. Right. Like, I'll only have one or two kids because I can't provide for ten and have a nice life. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Here's a comment that's kind of long. Neither Slavonic Bolsheviks and nationalists, nor their sympathizers in the Indies, in China, and in Japan, realize that when their people need most, is, uh, I'm sorry, Sim I'm, re can you read this? I With am. pleasure. What part? It's the comment. Comment. Neither the Slavonic Bolsheviks and nationalists nor their sympathizers in the Indies, in China, and in Japan, realize that what their peoples need most is not Western technology, but the social order, which, in addition to other achievements, has generated this technical knowledge. They lack, first of all, economic freedom and private initiative entrepreneurs and capitalism but they look only for engineers and machines right that was a great point 
yeah, so like if it's I guess we're gonna see it play out in Africa because we could like we're getting to the point where we can produce a lot of goods and just spring them on the people of Africa and but it's not creating the capitalist structure that created those. So it's a question is that a, is it even a good thing to help Africans and give them this technology? I guess it depends what you mean by give. I mean, technology is available for anyone to use. If they want to copy it, that's on them. But, that's but you mean distributing cell phones? Not even that. Cop- copying is the same thing. If if they copy it, that means they they haven't created the culture to create the, the social order to create that good. Mm-hmm. So they're going to get most of the fruits of that without... I think the analogy they used in the book was the cure for smallpox and the balance between the population. If they just magically found the cure for smallpox, then the population would substantially rise. But it... without the capitalist structure to also increase the amount of subsidence there is, then the population rise will cause, like, starvation and famine. Ah, I see what you mean. But, you know, if you find the... If you didn't magically find the cure for smallpox, you found it through, you know, capitalist, like, work in that structure, then if you find the small... the cure for smallpox that way chances are you're also building the structure to have enough food for everyone as well let me think about that for a minute So, do we not benefit from other technological innovation absent? Like, we don't have a perfect capitalist society either. Mm -hmm. So maybe it's all just a matter of degrees. There's more and less capitalism. And we don't have perfect capitalism. So, you know, who are we to benefit from technological innovation from more free places? Right, but the argument would be that we don't necessarily benefit. Hmm. So it's harmful to cultures yeah. that import technology and engineers without importing the social order to do that. Hmm. So that's kind of the interesting thing about Bitcoin because it's it's not just it's an economic system too. Hmm. So maybe it's a way of importing that technology while putting into place this capitalist structure. Hmm. Because it runs on capitalism. It can't, it doesn't work otherwise, right? Right. Like, capitalism is what holds it all together. So, like, if you're importing Bitcoin and, and integrating into the system, you have no choice but to embrace that social order. Hmm. So that's why it's pretty powerful. It's a really interesting thought. Yeah. My, I, I don't know. I, I would like to think more on that topic. Mm-hmm. My initial thought was about China and about um, like a communist China that has all this technology and engineers where they're like have this um, social credit score and all these AIs monitoring people if they smirk when they pass by a billboard of dear leader or whatever like creepy as hell and um, that's maybe an outgrowth of having technology without having a, a freedom Um, culture Mm -hmm. like it produces really negative results what I would consider to be negative I don't know yeah maybe other people think that's good but um I don't think it can be considered good (laughs) yeah by anyone (laughs) yeah another thing another top thing and then I know we want to get through this but 
my grandfather always used to talk about Honda Motors, how they were just, <clears throat> when he would go to China and Japan, uh, he noticed that Asians were like great imitators. That, I mean, this is just a, a racist old man, right? Yeah. I guess just saying like, oh, the, the Orientals, they imitate so well. But like, maybe the, he, w- he was trying to be uh, congratulatory, like say mm-hmm. like, they made a better motor by like imitating the Americans and then... Right. I mean, they are. Like, that's what they do. They take products, like, you know, technology, and then they recreate them and make them cheaper. Yeah. Like, there's always some Chinese knockoff of, like, headphones or... Right. Something. And... Anyway, I just think it's related to, like, yeah. this topic. Here's a comment. No foreign aggressor can destroy capitalist civilization if it does not destroy itself. What? No foreign aggressor can destroy capitalist civilization if it does not destroy itself. So. Oh, so a capitalist culture has to destroy itself. No one can. No one. No, this would be like China will never be able to destroy a capitalist civilization. Yeah. Without destroying itself as well. Oh, because I the, see. The capitalists oh. will always be able to think ahead, and they'll be, they'll anticipate. And because that yes, so they have better technology, better anticipation. Right, but then this was before. And this, also, the the uh, suckers rely on the capitalists to produce. Right, but this was before nuclear weapons. I feel like that changes. I think this was written in the fifties. 52? Oh, really? 51. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. But maybe not. It seems like these giant weapons that can destroy the world kind of blow apart this argument. I guess you destroy yourself, too. Yeah. Yeah. Mutually assured destruction. All right. Three, the harmony of the rightly understood interest. How does Mises view the state of nature? Uh, The characteristic mark of the state of nature is irreconcilable conflict. Each specimen is the rival of all other specimens. The means of subsistence are scarce and do not grant survival to all. Conflicts can never disappear. Hmm. So what is the source of conflict among humans? The scarcity. The subsistence is scarce. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I think so too. The source of the conflicts is always the fact that each man's portion curtails the portions of all other men. Right. What is the official social philosophy of Roman Catholicism and Anglo-Catholicism with regard to the critique of capitalism, at least when Mises was writing? Gosh, I, I don't know. I don't either. Uh, I see a thing about Catholicism here. Oh, is this where they... I think it's about Marx, Marxian philosophy. Um, The class struggle uh, can disappear only when a fair system of social organization, either socialism or interventionism, is substituted for the manifestly unfair capitalist mode of production. It is the official social philosophy of the Roman Catholicism as well as Anglo-Catholicism and is supported by many eminent champions of various Protestant denominations um, as well as Marxians, he says. So, I guess basically that, oh, the world is unfair in a capitalist society, but according to Roman Catholics at the time and Marxians, 
it would be fair and good if there were uh, s- socialism or interventionism. Mm-hmm. What are the two main errors on which all socialist and interventionist author base their analyses? I'll read that again. What are the two main errors on which all socialist and interventionist authors base their analysis? I, I know the answer, oh, <laughs> but go for I don't it. Okay. Um, First, they fail to recognize the speculative character inherent in all endeavors to provide for future one satisfaction. And um, they naively assume there cannot exist any doubt about the measures to be applied for the best possible provision of the consumers. I don't know if that's the same thing twice. Oh, yeah. The second fundamental error um, involved in the socialist critique of the market economy stems from their faulty theory of wages. They failed to realize that wages are the price paid for the earner's achievement, i.e. for the contribution of his efforts to the processing of the good concerned, or as people say, for the value which his services add to the value of the materials. So the first error that they make is everyone has to anticipate what the future needs. Even a socialist commissar, you can't just be like, oh, well, we need 10 nails today, so we'll need 10 nails tomorrow. Like, who knows what you're going to be doing tomorrow? You have to anticipate that. And it's an entrepreneur's job to do that. Um, Second, they think that wages are paid based on hours worked and not productivity added or like uh, value mm-hmm. that's added. Right. Okay. Four, private property. What <laughs> does private ownership imply? Um, hmm. I would say, I mean, it implies the owner is responsible for the profits and losses associated with the property. I don't really know. Private property implies a lot. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, how are we supposed to narrow that down? I would say... Private property implies um, freedom, in a sense, because you can't, like a slave can't own something, theoretically. It would be the owner of the slave's property. Mm -hmm. I think the answer they're looking for is the institution of private property where individuals own the means of production is the essence of the market economy. So I guess it implies individuals own the means of production. Okay, that makes sense. Good. How are the owners determined in a market economy? How are the owners determined? Yes. So it is true all modern property titles can be traced back to acts of appropriation so from unowned nature, or expropriation in the distant past. This is irrelevant irrelevant for every day the consumers in a market economy promote and demo owners based on their fulfillment of their consumers' desires. Okay, so initially it's, you know, you take ownership from some unowned nature, but after that it doesn't matter. It's just ownership's determined by consumers in the market. Yeah, that makes sense. Does the institution of private private property have the same significance in an autarkic setting as compared to a social one? I don't really know what that word is. Autaric? 
uh, right here, the third bullet from private property. Hmm. Does the institution of private property have the same significance in autarkic setting as compared to a social one? Well, I'd imagine if it's contrasting the word social to autarkic and it has the root aut, it must be like auto or like individual, like autistic. As mm -hmm. he used it earlier in the book. So, um, I would say no. So, I'm saying, I'm replacing the word like autarkic and social with one person versus many people. Mm -hmm. And I would say no, private property on an island doesn't really exist because there's no one to say um, like, oh, I, I own this sand, this fish, this whatever. Like, it's on, it only has meaning. Private property only has meaning in a social context. Mm -hmm. Okay. The conflicts of our age. Why wouldn't civil wars and international wars emerge in an unhampered market economy, according to Mises? Sorry, can you please repeat that? Okay, uh, section five, the conflicts of our age. Why wouldn't civil, civil wars and international wars emerge in an unhampered market economy? Oh, because uh, people are dependent on each other for things. Why mm -hmm. would they fight? Right. It's peace is so much more profitable, um, and capitalists know that. Mm -hmm. So, capitalists want peace more than everyone because um, it's the most profitable way. Right. It is not. So There's a comment. It is not sovereignty as such that makes for war but sovereignty of governments not entirely committed to the principles of the market economy why is the economic nationalism incompatible with durable peace economic what nationalism incompatible with durable peace oh cuz it's you can't be like um, by American only, we're going to produce everything. I think people like Venezuela tr try that and Cuba where they're like, we'll make everything. We'll make cars and we'll make, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't work. Um, it's better to trade with other countries who specialize or other people around the world who specialize. Right. And there's, and the second you go into, um, protectionism and nationalism and putting in tariffs you are restricting someone's private property yeah and yeah and you're interfering between two people who are trying to um, benefit each other it, they just happen to cross some imaginary line mm -hmm. cool that is that was it chapter 24 Wow. Can you believe we're on part five? Yeah. Is this the final part? I think there might be six. This Mises guy is great. Yeah. I, I can't see anyone writing a, like, a long treaty like this in today. today's world. There are seven parts. So we're about to enter part five of seven. Right. Social cooperation without a market. And the first chapter is 25, the imaginary construction of a socialist society. Great. So he's finally, he keeps alluding to this part five. I mm -hmm. can't wait for him to tear apart socialism. 